Yes, yeah, so I've been involved with D3 uh, for quite a few years now. Um, I remember back in the day when Mike Bostock had a different icon uh, for his gravatar, and his icon was a kind of hand, and I always used to imagine he was kind of the hand of God, because every time he made a commit to a repository, it would feel like he was turning everything into gold. Um, so there we are. I've been involved with D3 for about uh, three, four years, and I guess I've kind of started off uh, contributing maybe some kind of typo fix or something like that. And then it gradually uh, got more and more involving. Um, I submitted various patches to various things, and they got larger and larger. Um, and I guess my primary contribution has been um, the d3.geo uh, module, which I've done a lot of work on um, over the past couple of years. So today I'd like to talk to you um, about something I call geometric madness, which is um, kind of a vague title, but really I was intending to convey um, the state of mind that I have when I'm trying to solve some of these problems involving spherical geometry. Um, so the demo that you see before you is uh, a fairly uh, popular page on my site. It's, it shows various map uh, projections being transitioned. Um, it, I mean, D3 has a large number of map projections. Um, some of them are fairly esoteric. Um, some of them are more useful than others. And this uh, just shows how you can transition from one uh, projection to the other using um, a simple interpolation function. Um, so these projections are all uh, kind of similar in that they involve the same type of clipping. So um, they're all kind of, uh, if you imagine the clipping uh, as being a kind of cylindrical clipping where you have um, a single line along the anti-meridian, which is like the line along the back of the globe, and you make the cut there. Oops, sorry. Um, so that makes it easy to transition between these projections. Um, so I've got about half of my talk is going to be about things that you've probably already seen if you already know my work. The other half is going to be a few new things that I haven't released yet. Um, and I haven't released them because they're not quite finished, but hopefully um, all will be well and I can demo a few things for you. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about that you may or may not have already seen is um, the spherical... Voronoi diagrams. Uh, so this is one of my, well, this is one of my favorite um, computational geometry algorithms. So most of the time, if you learn about this at university, uh, you learn about uh, Voronoi diagrams as being on an infinite 2D plane. Uh, but I wanted to solve it for the Earth, <coughs> which is a sphere. So it's a little bit more tricky. Um, so the algorithm for this was uh, really interesting because uh, I won't get into too many technical <laughs> details, don't worry, uh, but essentially a Voronoi diagram and a, something called a Delaunay triangulation are dual to each other. So if I click there, you can see the triangulation of those points, and you can also see um, the regions of the Voronoi diagram. So a Voronoi diagram, um, essentially given a set of seed points, um, you can partition a surface into a set of regions, and each region uh, contains all points closest to a particular seed point than any other. Um, so by way of example, probably my most popular page is this one, which is a Voronoi diagram of airports. Um, <laughs> it's not every single airport in the world, but it's all the large and medium ones, which have scheduled flights, which is about 2,980. Um, so this people really like, I guess, because you can kind of see the outline of the countries uh, due to the density of the airports. Um, and people, I did get quite a few emails uh, with this one. People were you know, angry because I hadn't included their favorite airport, um, that kind of thing. So. so there, hopefully that kind of shows um, or in a diagram on a sphere, how that looks. Um, so each region um, is closest to a particular airport than any other. So you can see where your closest airport is by looking on this map. Um, another couple of ones I did was uh, repartitioning the United States um, according to uh, locations for capitals. 
um, which again people got very excited about. And here's one um, of the world repartitioned using uh, capitals again. So if I can go back and sort of explain to you a little bit why I was so excited about um, how the algorithm works. So it turns out that the Delaunay tri triangulation on a sphere is actually, you can compute it by finding the convex hull of the points embedded into um, 3D Cartesian space. So that probably sounded a bit technical jargon to you. Um, so essentially you take um, all of these points that are on the sphere and just imagine them in 3D space and you find the convex hull of these. Um, if you don't know what a convex hull is, it's the kind of, if you imagine creating a polygon, it's all the outermost points if you have a point cloud. But on a sphere, they're all on the, on the convex hull. Um, and then you, so that, that particular surface, so in 3D you have a set of faces on a polyhedron and that particular surface essentially gives you the Delaunay triangulation and there's a mathematical idea called a dual which, is, which allows you to convert between um, the triangulation and the Voronoi diagram quite easily. Um, so that's how that works. Um, so this kind of led to a few other things. Um, I like to call this uh, the positive side of yak shaving. So sometimes when you solve problems, you end up solving other problems and other problems and other problems. And it all gets very interesting. Um, some people think that's a negative thing, but I think it's positive because you get to solve lots of interesting uh, problems. So, um, gave you a sneak preview of the next thing. Uh, so this is something called a a uh, power diagram, which is a kind of Voronoi diagram, except that you've got weights um, for each point. So um, I won't te get too technical about it, but essentially you can make the regions larger or smaller depending on, on this particular weighting concept. And it turns out you can uh, compute this by uh, converting these weighted points into um, something called a, a paraboloid. So you convert them into this three-dimensional three space. And then again, I can reuse the uh, convex hull algorithm that I was using for the previous diagram. And that lets us um, do this, which is a Voronoi tree map. Uh, if you don't know what a tree map is, it's where you take a hierarchical set of data, and um, each data point usually has a weight, and you partition something hierarchically um, so that uh, the areas of, of each region is proportional to the weight. Um, so this is quite fun. Um, I did find some issues with the various papers that I read about this and that they didn't really seem to converge that well. Um, but I kind of ended up just randomly seeming to find quite a good convergence. I think I just used a lot of randomness, so you think, see things jumping around quite a lot. So if you see... <coughs> that graph there that shows you the relative error. Um, so you refresh, you can see the relative error bouncing around and eventually it, it converges. Um, hopefully. Yeah, so you get a lot of jumping sometimes to try and correct it. Um, you can also change the shape of the outermost region. Okay, great, so that's Voronoi diagrams and various other things that I managed to solve at the same time as solving it for the sphere. Um, <laughs> next, I'd like to talk about uh, a bit more about map projections. So, just in case, I'm guessing that um, maybe some of you haven't really seen various map projections that I've done, so I thought I'd do a quick preview of a few of my favorites. Um, just demonstrating what can be done with uh, D3 and the projections that we've got on D3. Uh, one of my very, very favorites is um, the maps by Spillhaus, who was an oceanographer. And his maps um, are interrupted maps. So they cut the earth in a bit like an orange peel. Um, but he liked to put the cuts along the edges of land. And the reason is that um, so then being an oceanographer, you can focus on the oceans rather than uh, typically, a lot of maps uh, show you their um, 
there are often cuts along the uh, ocean. Can I get into that? Ah, I have no internet, so I'll leave that. <laughs> this is a stereographic projection. Um, again, it's cuts along the coastline. This is a kind of combination of a couple of projections. Okay, this is probably um, the one that took the most amount of effort to create. Um, like I said at the beginning, uh, most maps are quite easy in terms of uh, chopping up the geometries that appear on the globe because you only have to chop them along one line, which is you know, the back of the globe. So you rotate this globe, um, you have the antimeridian and it's along there. But with this kind of projection, which is one invented by Buckminster Fuller, um, it's called either the Air Ocean World or Dimaxion Map. Um, it's based on an icosahedron, and so the cuts are not a straight line. So you have to cut along this jagged line there. And this has led to um, a lot more so-called yak shaving to, uh, to solve this. Um, I'm going to talk a bit more about um, things that I've done with that um, that I haven't published yet. Um, so. So that, that's the icosahedron, and this is a cube octahedron here. Um, okay. Now I get to show you something you haven't seen before, um, or at least it's code that I haven't released yet, um, because it may, may have a few bugs. Okay. This is um, an implementation of Boolean operations on polygons. <laughs> and maybe it doesn't really look like much. Um, so it's taking a polygon, which is uh, a large landmass, and it's um, finding the intersection with a spiral polygon. Um, and you can also adjust the Boolean operation. So you can say um, subtraction, you know, one from the other. I'm not sure what happened there. That's the union. OK, so let me tell you about how difficult this has been. So I've spent, <laughs> this is where geometric madness comes into it. Um, I spent a long time thinking about how to solve this. And every time I think I've solved it, um, I find another you know, edge case that I haven't solved. And uh, my wife keeps on telling me, I thought you'd solved clicking already years ago. You know, um, But I think. I may have solved it this time. Uh, <laughs> so that's just a demonstration of, of my current um, implementation. Uh, so there is a, an algorithm called the Greiner Hormann algorithm, which is a really great algorithm. It's really elegant, and I love it. And um, when I finally you know, publish this, I think it'll be kind of one of my favorite pieces of code. It's just so kind of it, it solves all the, all the um, where well it doesn't solve all the edge cases. That's, that's kind of the issue with it, that there are some edge cases that in the paper they mentioned that, oh, well, it would, their solution is simply to randomly uh, jitter some of the points. Um, so if you have a vertex that lands exactly on another segment, um, their solution is to just jitter it slightly so you, know, you can not have to deal with the case. Uh, yeah, but it turns out that's not really that great way of solving it, especially if, if you have quite long lines, because they can move quite a lot. Uh, yeah, so it's a great, uh, wonderful algorithm. Uh, so I think I've found a way to, to handle edge cases, but um, when I finally release it, maybe, maybe you'll uh, see how I've done that. Um, this is uh, one of the problems. So with computational geometry, um, Typically, you have inputs which are points in space, and they're specified as floating point coordinates. 
Um, often you have to do various arithmetic operations on these coordinates, and um, floating point is kind of tricky. I mean, it's not magic. You can analyze it and you can work out what has gone wrong, but if you're not really aware of the problems that can occur, um, things like this can happen. So this is a naive implementation of um, a special predicate which tells you whether a point is to the left or to the right of a line or on the line. Um, so the left-hand side is the naive implementation, the right-hand side is the exact implementation. Uh, so you can see um, along the axes I've got multiples of machine epsilon, which is the smallest possible uh, floating point uh, delta, well, or thereabouts. And so uh, I've plotted um, blue if it's on uh, you know, the right side, red if it's on the left, um, and another color if it's on the middle. Um, and you can see it completely messes up in the naive version. The naive, naive version is a simply um, the standard implementation of a cross product. Um, and what you have to do is you have to analyze the directed graph of arithmetic operations. And there's lots of papers on this. Um, so the right-hand side is the implementation of various papers. Uh, that just goes to show that you can't really take things for granted. But you, this is one of the things I found when implementing polygon clipping, is that oftentimes uh, you think you've solved it, and then some slightly random uh, modification to a floating point coordinate causes everything to go, go wrong. And it can be because you've made certain assumptions like um, this, that you know, it's going to work like you might expect. Oh yeah, you can drag it. <coughs> this is, uh, so as well as being really obsessed with map projections, I'm generally obsessed with algorithms and data structures. Um, so I was quite excited to use um, some data structures to really super accelerate um, the finding of intersections. Uh, so this is the one that I use for the sphere. And essentially what I do is I take each line segment and I find the bounding circle, which is really easy to find. And then I merge um, <coughs> circles that are next to each other. And I eventually end up with this tree of circles. And that allows me to find intersections really quickly because it's a lot faster to find um, you know, intersections if you have two trees because you can do uh, a search on the tree which is only logarithmic rather than having to search every possible combination. Uh, so that's, so yeah, going back to the demo that I showed you, uh, the reason that's reasonably quick even though the data is quite large um, is because it uses that tree. So I was pretty pleased when it turned out to be so fast. Right, I have another new thing to show you. Again, it's new only in the sense that it's new code that I've written. Um, it's not a new invention or anything. Okay, so this is an implementation of um, contours in D3. A few years ago, I did implement an algorithm called Conrec. Um, but it has various problems with it. Um, this is a much better algorithm. It's called marching squares. Um, this is really great for maps, obviously. You can create contours from um, any kind of measurements that you have on a grid. Um, in fact, there's a, there's a version of marching squares kind of called meandering triangles. <coughs> so you can operate in triangles as well. Um, and also find the contours. So this is the monthly surface temperature. So you can see it uh, changing uh, throughout the year. And it's the mean temperature taken over a long-term uh, number of years, so about 20 years. Uh, so contours obviously don't just have to be used for maps. They can be used for maths as well. Uh, so these are some kind of weird functions, weird elliptic functions. Um, there's something which is called doubly periodic, which means that on the complex plane, they repeat themselves in both dimensions. So they're called SM and uh, CM. 
and that's showing the real and imaginary parts. So that's CM, which looks quite similar to the previous one. So you've got hexagonal and triangular type symmetry, although it's essentially all triangular. Okay. Um, So out of all the map projections that have been published so far, I haven't actually uh, shown anyone my favorite map projection. Um, and it turns out these functions are uh, related to my favorite map projection of all time, which is here. <laughs> uh, this is called Lee's tetrahedric uh, conformal projection. So it's a conformal projection, similar to Mercator. So it distor distorts areas quite a lot, but it preserves angles. Um, and I generally find conformal projections look quite nice, um, even though the, they have quite bad distortion. Uh, okay, um, now I've got some other uh, things to show you now. These are some experiments that I've done with uh, raster maps. So I've taken some of the weird projections that you saw on the previous screens, and what I've done is um, I've taken pixel data and I've projected it, and I've well tried to be clever, use really really big source data, and I've actually I've actually forward projected it. Um, it is possible to use an inverse projection and go in in reverse, but for these I've actually forward projected it. Um, but because the source data is quite large, it it works out fine. Uh, so I just thought I'd show you these, a bit of eye candy. That's the spill house. This is um, basically the Waterman projection. That's Mars. Okay, I think um, I've shown you pretty much everything I wanted to show you today. So um, I'd be happy to take any kind of questions you want to ask about D3, maps, anything, <laughs> algorithms, etc. So thanks for listening. So are there any questions for Jason? Hello. So uh, how did you learn all these maths? Because <laughs> <laughs> that's really maps? impressive. Maps or maths? Maths. Maths. Oh. Sorry, math. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, I read a lot of Wikipedia. Okay, from the Met Office. Um, I use open layers quite a lot with GeoJSON data. Is in terms of using your D3 visualization, what sort of zooming and interactive capability do you envisage you getting with it? Sure. Uh, So this is a, an implementation of um, it's a very similar zooming and rotating capability that Google Earth has, which isn't actually to everyone's taste. Um, but the point that you drag remains under the mouse. And if you, if you drag it horizontally like that, it does cause the Earth to tilt um, because of the kind of maths that it uses underneath. Um, I kind of like that because it treats the Earth like a sphere and it doesn't require north to always be up. Um, it's possible to do other kinds of rotations. And you can also zoom, and, and again, it maintains the mass. <laughs> so you can see it rolls the Earth there as you're zooming. So this is very similar to Google Earth. Um, hopefully that answers your question. Hi. 
Uh, can you give us an idea on how many points you had in your polygon intersection uh, example? Yeah. And, and the performance, how, how fast? So this was the uh, 50, 1 to 50 million data set. It's fairly small, it's 700 kilobytes, but um, that demo actually works really well even on the much larger one, which is the 1 to 10. Uh, so that's 4 megabytes. Um, I was quite surprised that it, it was interactive even with the larger data set, but I did notice a few bugs, so I didn't want to demo it uh, today. <laughs> So it, it did flicker a little bit, but it was it was really surprisingly fast. And I had I took two copies of the world and intersected them, and it worked fine interactively. So it was you know within a few milliseconds. Next question. Okay. Uh. Hi. Um. D3 seems a pretty comprehensive library for data viz. I mean, are there any major or, or sort of developments that you, you foresee coming? Um, I think D3's kind of reached this point where it's quite stable and it kind of <coughs> solves, seems to me, like 99% of what people really need. And there are plugins as well that people use. Um, so I guess my understanding is that the D3 core, that we don't really want it to become too bloated. Um, so we prefer to keep, you know, too many features out of it, yeah. only the ones that are most, you know, used. Um, I mean, I'm quite excited about the various geometry things we've been working on over the past couple of years, but I guess that's probably not necessarily going to be part of D3 itself. Um, but a lot, of the, a lot of new features and new developments happen as plugins, and there's quite an active uh, development of plugins by you know, myself and others. Um, and, you know, sometimes a plugin might get accepted into D3 core, but not necessarily. Hello, Jeremy Walton from the Met Office. Uh, when you talk about your Boolean operations on polygons yes. not being published yet, does yes. that mean I can't see it on your website? Is, is when you're talking about publication, you mean sticking up on your website? Is yes, th that's right. Um, I guess I just want to. Um, iron out all the, all the final little bugs before I right. publish it live. Um, okay, looks very nice. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. You had uh, power dry diagrams and you had Voronoi diagrams on spheres. What about power diagrams on spheres? Yes, good question. Uh, it is possible, and because the algorithm that I used for the convex hull um, is generalizable to n dimensions, um, I think it's possible simply by um, a transformation into uh, a four-dimensional space, so adding the uh, weight as, as just the transformation in a fourth coordinate. I haven't actually got around to doing that yet. But the convex hull, hull algorithm is quite cool because it is generalizable to n dimensions. Um, Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, cover I, see, um, I was wondering, can you give some more details about the contour uh, thing you showed? Yeah. Uh, how would that be? Usable for the for the end for the for the developer, uh, could you get any set of, of points in there and then and then do the, the contouring or ah, yeah. yeah so this is um, not published but it's kind of beginning of uh, an explanation of how it works underneath um, so it uses marching squares <laughs> and the way it works is you uh, take your original grid and you essentially mark points as being above or below uh, the threshold. So you've got the black and the white dots there. And then um, if you look here, you can take any one of those cells, so any combination of you know, four neighboring points there, and 
um, you exhaustively enumerate all possibilities, which gives you 16. And then um, this is just a random grid. Then you apply each of those cases to there, and then you add interpolation. And that's essentially what it is. But you, you can do it with triangles as well, which is far fewer cases, and you don't have to deal with saddle points. And it is possible to <laughs> do it with other kinds of shapes, but there's no <laughs> real point other than to show off that I can <laughs> list them all. And um, how would that be exposed? Uh, uh, could, could you just have a, a set of uh, elevation points and it could give you contours on... on yeah, I think this... Uh, this is the kind of library that I've envisaged. So you would have um, a configurable function kind of following the D3 kind of philosophy and then you'd have um, a function that you pass a grid in and then it uh, gives you the ISO lines. And the way I implemented it was it allowed you to set an extent. So you, the input data is simply one huge array and the extent allows you to automatically compute the X and Y coordinates so you don't have to pass those in as well. And you can also choose different topologies. So obviously on a sphere, um, you'd want all the topmost and bottommost ones of the grid to be the same so you can connect them. Thank you. played any with embeddings on no non-orientable surfaces like Nubia strips and flying bottles? Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> this is really something I wanted to try on a, on a Mobius strip because um, you can put uh, the antipodes on a Mobius strip, and it works out really nicely. Um, but I haven't actually done it, so it only half answers your question. Robert Cosero from Tableau Software. Hello. I've got two questions. Uh, one is, have you, since you've talked about all these different kinds of maps, there's one that I really like that I left out, and of course everybody has their own favorite thing, but have you done, uh, have you thought about doing myriahedral maps? I'm ah, sure you've yes. seen them. So <coughs> myriahedral maps are really, uh, I mean, for people that don't know, myriahedral projections are, um, I mean, they're kind of, that they got that name because they were published in a paper reasonably recently. Um, and they're derived similarly to the Diamaxian map that I showed, but um, they're polygons with a huge number of faces. And in order to deal with those kind of polygons, you need to have really fast um, clipping. So that's kind of why I've been working on it, because people keep on asking me every so often, can you do myriahedral projections? And it's much harder to do the forward projection than the reverse projection. The reverse projection is reasonably simple if you have a fast enough way to discover which face in the polyhedron the you know, projected pixel was. When you go forwards, you have to actually do the clipping. Um, so for doing rasters of them, which is what they did in their paper with the nice animations, it's not as difficult as doing the clipping because then you have a really complicated path that you have to then do the clipping on. Um, so I've got a plugin and the uh, plugin is is what I've been using for a lot of those kind of weird maps that you've seen. So the Damaxian one uses something where it takes a polyhedron and you specify the unfolding tree. So you specify how where the cuts should be and how it should be unfolded. So myriahedral projections are like that, but way more faces and more complicated tree. And also the nice thing that they have is the ability to set weights. So you can decide whether to cut along 
certain areas more than others, depending on various arbitrary kind of data points. So, but yeah, that's something I'd really love to do. It's kind of the end goal of, of all of this work. <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks for asking. And then one qu more, more quick question. Yeah. You're, I noticed that you're very interested in, in the geometry. Yes. But of course, D3 is essentially, well, I'm not sure if it's true, but it's a visualization library. So are you interested also in the visualization side of things, or do you care mostly about the geometry? Yeah, I'm definitely interested in the visualization side of things. Um, I guess that was just the focus of this talk, because I, that's where I've done most of the kind of uh, research and development type stuff. And that's, I guess, what I'm most excited about. Um, but for example, the Voronoi tree maps is something that you know, is visualization. and. Um, someone once asked me, what should I learn if I want to become good at creating new visualizations? And I actually told them, you should learn linear algebra, linear algebra and uh, geometry, because I think that's really important to come up with these um, interesting layouts and various encodings of data to a visual form. I mean, it's quite fundamental to it. So, um, yeah. Thank you. I might argue with you about the geometry part, but... <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions for Jason? Uh, kind of following on from that, how would you describe what you do? Are you a programmer? Are you a <laughs> mathematician? Are you a visualization? What, what do you do, Jason? All of the above. All of the above. <laughs> Great. OK. Good questions. Everyone's got a completely transformed view of uh, geometry after the result of that talk. Can we just thank Jason once again for such a, an interesting talk? Thank you.